So, um, our teaching text for today comes from Luke 15. It's verses 1 through 7. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So we are continuing our series, Jesus According to Jesus. And as I was planning this series, I was just so caught up in the shepherding heart of Jesus that I just felt like one week doesn't do it. Um, you know, last week we talked about shepherding as this, this metaphor, as a, a leadership assertion that, that Jesus made. But, but to talk about the words of Jesus, I am the good shepherd, without really getting to the shepherding heart of Jesus, it, it would be incomplete. Like, I just, I couldn't do it. And, and so there's um, just such incredible interest in this person, Jesus, like not only in religious circles, but, but in secular circles as well. So if you do a Google search, Google search, there should be an image here coming up. Yeah. Of who is, don't even type it out, just G. So, so we've got this like really sad, viral, cultural moment, you know, Jeffrey Epstein. And then you've got who is Jesus and who is Jesus Christ. Like millions of people are, are searching about Jesus. They, they want to know him. Now, I don't know if you heard about this, but um, back in February, there was a, a new Barna study that came out, and it was called Reviving Evangelism. And Christianity Today, they, they picked up on it, and this, this one statistic in particular, which says half of the millennial Christians say it's wrong to evangelize. The the actual phrase that they said here is 47% of practicing Christian millennials agreed with this statement. It is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in the hopes that they will someday share the same faith. So now in the the passage that we're talking about today, Jesus is talking about evangelism. You you know, the thing that, that we love about Jesus is the fact that he tried to reach people. He tried to care for people. He tried to persuade them away from their sin, away from from their brokenness and their shame. He he tried to convert them into his followers so that they could find life. And and so in some ways, you could describe Jesus' entire ministry as evangelism. He's going around and he's trying to persuade people that he is the Messiah and the kingdom of God is actually here. Now, the crazy thing, sinners loved Jesus. Like like Jesus always had to have these, he seemed to have these sinners and tax collectors gathering around him as he was preaching. So, back to our survey, that, that same group, where almost half of them say, I don't think it's appropriate to convert people. 94% of millennials believe that the best thing that could ever happen to someone is that they would come to know Jesus. This was also in the survey. Like, what a challenge. Like, think about that. Like, what's happening in the heart of Jesus' followers? Like, you have a desire. Like, I want to share Jesus, but I think it's wrong. Now, I absolutely believe that there are people who have lost the heart of Jesus. Like some people have made religion a self-help tool, or they've, they've turned it into cultural Christianity. That, that is definitely true. But I don't think that's primarily the issue here. I think people are overwhelmed by the challenges of our culture. Like they're just overwhelmed by the cultural moment that we find ourselves in. You know, multiple religious traditions, uh, diverse cultural traditions as well. 
complicated ethical questions, questions of sexuality, how to integrate faith and, and politics, integrating our, our beliefs and our behavior. There are just so many challenges, and, and you throw all of that on top of this general angst that people feel in their hearts. Like, how can Jesus be the only way to God? How can a loving God send people to hell? What about pain and suffering? What about science and faith? Can you even trust the Bible anyways? And so I believe that most people feel like you, you need a PhD in apologetics and ethics to say, I went to church when asked the question, what did you do this weekend? Oh, really? Good. I've got some questions for you. Let's just go through my list. And, and we live in a society that says you should never persuade anyone as if that's a neutral statement. It just feels like people are overwhelmed. Like, we don't know how to interact with this. We don't know what to do with it. So I remember I moved here from Los Angeles, and that's where all my sports fandom comes from. Sorry, guys. Um, but I moved here in the year 2000. And honestly, like, I felt like I had moved into the Bible Belt. Like, it was nuts. Now, I know, like, Denver Metro is, is not the Bible Belt. It's never been the Bible Belt. But just relative to where I came from, from Los Angeles, uh, at that time especially, it just felt so, like, conservative. And I experienced, like, a bit of a culture shock. You know, I don't, I don't know if you, you, can, you can relate to this at all. But, but it felt like a context where Jesus was just kind of assumed, where, where if you said you need to get right with God, it was probably understood that you meant the Christian God. And that, that you knew what it meant to get right with God. And that you knew where to go and how to do it. So in Acts chapter 2, you have the Apostle Peter. And he's preaching in a primarily Jewish context. And in his message, you have references to the Psalms, you have a prophecy from the, the prophet Joel, and he basically says, you know the God I'm talking about. You killed his Messiah. He rose from the dead, and now God is going to send his Holy Spirit. And so in this setting, they, they knew God, they, they understood the scriptural references being made, and they knew who the Messiah was very clearly. Acts chapter 10. If you read these accounts, and I encourage you, just go home this week and, and read these accounts in the book of Acts. Peter shares the gospel with Cornelius, and, and Cornelius is a Roman centurion, which means basically he's their enemy. And, and Peter begins to preach the gospel to them, and, and he's got some reference points that are very different from his sermon in Acts chapter 2. Because the gospel is now, it's moving away from this assumed context. But when you get to Acts 17, and I encourage you, read Paul's sermon there. He, he doesn't just start with the God of Israel. He, he doesn't start with the scriptures. He goes all the way back to creation. And he's like, hey, I know that you're very religious. Like, I, I certainly commend that. There's this unknown God. And that God made everything, the heavens and the earth and everything within them. And he goes all the way back to this shared assumption that they all had, that there is a God. And then Paul kind of says, I'll fill in the gaps from there. So in these three different contexts, you have three very different messages. And, and here's why I bring this up. We are living in Acts 17. You know that, right? Like, like, that's part of the tension, is that, that we have been trained with Acts 2 instincts, but we live in an Acts 17 culture. And so the result is heated debates, angry Facebook posts, because we don't know how to come up with shared frameworks that, that, and perspectives, and it then becomes incredibly difficult to have a conversation, a thoughtful conversation conversation about God. So all of that said, even though we know that our culture has changed, God's heart hasn't changed. 
Even though our culture is moving further and further away from him, God's heart and his desire to bring people back to himself never changes. And so we have to embrace the priority of Jesus. No matter how hard the culture is, no matter how godless or how secular or or distant it is, this is our responsibility. That's why you're alive right now. You, You weren't born in the past. You're not born in the future. You are here right now because you are the people that God has entrusted his mission to in this Acts 17 context. And we have to embrace this priority regardless of what the statistics say. So in this parable, Jesus, he leaves the 99 to find the one. There's there's 99 believers and yet, yet Jesus leaves them to themselves in the open field to find the one. So, in the Denver metro area, I think the most generous of, of studies and surveys would say that less than 10% of our city attends a local church. Less than 10%. So so if Jesus is disproportionately committed to the one leaving the 99, how much more do you think he's going to leave the 10 to go chase after the 90? Don't you think, like, wouldn't his heart just swell up? Like, wouldn't he be just moved with such compassion? I mean, you read about Jesus, he, he wept for them like sheep without a shepherd. He's saying, somebody has to see what's happening here. Somebody needs to see the opportunity that lies before you. Who is going to join me in this mission? I'm the shepherd that seeks and saves that which is lost. So, all right, I can, I can already, like, I'm in your head. I'm in your mind. I know what's going on here. Here we go again. I don't know how to do that. I I already feel bad enough. Like, is this going to be one of those you suck, try harder sermons? Not at all. Like, you should know me better than that. About a month ago, uh, I was at an event, and I had the opportunity to meet Mark Middleberg. And he wrote this book called Becoming a Contagious Christian. And meeting him reminded me of this book, and it just, like, it flooded me, and it just compelled me to share what I had learned from it. Because I'm listening to a generation that feels overwhelmed by the prospects of sharing their faith. And I see the opportunity that we have here in this moment. I want everyone to understand how God made you and how you can participate in the mission of Jesus. So, How many of you know your Enneagram number? Okay, a few. Yep, put those hands up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Uh, How many of you know your Myers-Briggs? Any other? Myers-Briggs. Keep them up. Enneagram and Myers-Briggs. How about DISC? DISC. Not too many DISC fans out there. Strength Finders? Strength Finders, anyone? Okay, we get... Don't you just love this stuff? Like, it's so good. Ooh, tell me more about me. And, And it's fascinating so, so last week, Lauren and I, we got to spend a couple of days in uh, Palisade, and so the drive over is, it's, it's long, three and a half hours, man, but um, we were just, spent most of that drive listening to podcasts about the Enneagram, and just kind of understanding like our different personality types, and, and how we see the world. It, it made this three and a half hour car ride seem much shorter. Now, I say all of this. Because I I want you to consider evangelism, these evangelism styles through that sort of framework. These are different styles, and they help us see different ways that we're naturally inclined or even gifted to respond to people with the gospel. And I just, I find this very freeing because it doesn't just say that there's one way and moralize it saying this is the biblical way to do it. It basically says there's all of these different ways to introduce people to Jesus. And so my prayer today is that you would be sitting there, and as we go through all of this, you would be asking the question, is that me? Is that me? So here we go. 
uh, style. Number one, the testimonial style. And this is just one way that we can share the good news of Jesus. So John chapter 9. We've talked about this guy quite a bit in the last few weeks. Jesus heals a man who was born blind. And the Pharisees, they don't like the timing. They don't like the manner in which Jesus has done this. So they are angry. And they're putting pressure on this formerly blind man's family. And the parents say, hey, whoa, 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 let him speak for himself. Like, he's a grown man. And so they question this man regarding Jesus, and they're saying things like, the way that he does his ministry violates our laws. This guy could never be from God. Confess that he's a sinner. They're pressuring him with these questions. And his response is, it's classic. He says, look, whether he's a sinner or not, I have no idea. Here's what I know. An hour ago, I couldn't see. And you guys look amazing. (laughs) You guys look great. Like, I I don't know. I don't know. I I couldn't see an hour ago, and now I see all of you. I, I don't, whether he's a sinner or not, like, that's your problem. I'm enjoying my sight. And so he basically says, like, I don't know all the answers. I don't understand it all, but I just know that I can see. And this is also a great approach for someone who's new in their faith. You, you haven't read any books. Uh, you, you don't even know what apologetics are. You, you think it's being sorry for being a Christian. And, and so people might say, oh, you're a Christian now. Do you believe in evolution? I've never read a book on evolution. I have no idea. I just know that I hated my life before, and now I'm filled with joy and peace because of what Jesus has done. What are you doing with your life? You just say, hey, I don't know. Um, that, that sounds really credible. What I do know is that I hated my life, and now I love my life. Do you want to come to church? Do, do, do you want to meet Jesus? Don't underestimate the power of your story. People aren't asking you to solve all the world's problems. Um, they're, they're simply asking, what happened to you? And the reality is that I very, very rarely meet people who are deeply read in all the fields of human knowledge, and they have these curated arguments against God. Like, I'm not saying they're not out there. It's just not most people. And so you just say, I I don't know about that. I just know that I couldn't see, and now I can. The testimonial style, the, the second is the invitational style. So John chapter 4, we have this like kind of scandalous encounter with Jesus. He seemed to do this a lot. Um, Jesus is going through Samaria, and, and the Jews hate the Samaritans because they're these, these half-breeded, half-race. They compromised when, when they were in exile, and the Jews believed that they should have just died rather than marry with, into these other nations, um, these pagan nations around them. So The Samaritans, they still worship the God of Israel, even though they're social outcasts. Uh, They create their own synagogues and places of worship. And so Jesus, he comes to this well. It's called Jacob's Well. And this woman, who's like the outcast of the outcast, she wants to chat with Jesus. And this is like highly inappropriate. You can almost like see the disciples saying like, well, it looks like we're never getting invited to the synagogue Christmas party again, (laughs) except they don't celebrate Christmas, and, and Christmas wasn't a thing, and um, so maybe it's the, the synagogue Hanukkah party. Anyways, um, Jesus says to her, hey, you've been married multiple times, and I'm going to give you living water. And her response is like, yes, give me this living water. So she receives it, and she goes back to her village, and she says, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. That's her response. Like, come and see what Jesus did. I recently read a statistic that said 82% of people are open to coming to church if they're invited. And I read this, and I was like, no. No. There's no way that's true. That is an old statistic. So I, I, I did some double checking. Turns out I was right. It's totally old. That is not true. Right now, only 63% of people would be willing to come to church if someone invited them. 63%. 
don't say no for people. Like, let someone say no for themselves. So, um, how many of you have ever been turned down for a date? I certainly have. Yeah, yeah. A couple of you are not being honest right now. Um, you know, so you get turned down for a date, and then you say what? Like, that's it. I'm never going on a date again. One time. Oh, they said no. Like, no, you got back in the game. You, 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 don't, you, you got back out there. You're doing your thing. The point is, don't say no for people. Like, don't let it break your heart. If it doesn't work out, like, okay, whatever. Like, somebody says, no, I'm busy. You say, okay, sweet. And you just move on with your life. But sometimes all you have to say is just, just come and see. Just come and check it out. And if they say no, you just you move on. Everyone can invite someone to something. So the next style is the direct style. And this is the account that we see in Acts chapter 2, where Peter, he's in this assumed religious context, and he stands up and basically warns them, save yourselves. Now, I'm not suggesting you get your megaphone and cardboard sign and find a, a, you know, a popular area in Denver. I'm simply saying, we, I think we have this tendency. We read our favorite scene about Jesus, you know, the one that, that you know, shows us mercy when we've messed up. And we just paint that as the only biblical picture of Jesus. But have you ever read the Gospels? Like, Jesus doesn't say what you think he said. You remember it wrong. Jesus talks about hell more than anyone else in the Bible. Jesus says things like, don't fear those who can kill the body, but fear him who can throw both body and soul into hell. Like, that's hate speech. No, that's Jesus in his great love. And so sometimes, normally eights on the Enneagram, uh, there are these people who need hard truth like that. Like some people need a wake-up call or, or a hard word to actually get to them. And so there's a legitimate place for, for hard warnings of the gospel of Jesus. And there's a need for this direct style. The next one you have is this intellectual style. So going back to Acts 17. You got the Apostle Paul, and he's in the leading center of philosophy in his day. He's with these Greek philosophers, and he gives such an extraordinary message that these, these leading thinkers, these cultural elites of the day, they hear him, and they begin to interact with the gospel. And so he's talking to the Epicureans and these Stoic philosophers, and he uses, he uses poetry, he uses philosophy. He uses snippets of their own religion. He starts where they are. So the direct style, they, they start with God's word. But this, this um, intellectual style starts with where the person is and builds a bridge to Jesus. So this is an important approach in our world today. Uh, we need people who are going to deal with the complex issues that we face today. What does it mean to be human? That's actually a question out there now. What does it mean to be human? Like, what about issues of, of love, you know, sexuality, and, and how do we express that? How does legislation deal with that? Or, or when we talk about interacting with other faiths, or what does it mean to have all of these different religions and truth codes? People need to think through this stuff and bring us the fruit of their research. There's a tremendous need for this intellectual style in our world today. We need that in the church, and I'm just so thankful for those that have this intellectual style. The next one is the relational style. 1 Thessalonians 2 says this, Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. This is the person who just brings you into their heart. Like, have you ever met someone like that? They, they might not say, you know, I don't know, I was blind, but now I see. But they, they might not say, hey, come and see. They might just say, have a seat at my table. Pour out your heart. David Augsburger, he says, being listened to is so close to being loved that the average person cannot tell the difference. Like, that's true. 
When someone listens to you, when you, when you pour out your heart, you, just, you feel seen, you feel known. And Christian Morgenstern says, home is not the building you live in. Home is where you're understood. But when you finally meet people who, who don't just open their minds to you, but they make room in their hearts for you, they, they listen to you. They, they listen to your arguments. They, they listen to your problems, you know, all the stuff that you're, that you're wrestling through, and they, just, they give you the gospel and their lives. I'm so grateful for people who have this relational style. They, they, just, they, they don't just bring you the gospel. They bring you their lives as well. They make space. They listen. It's a rare and beautiful thing in today's culture to find someone who would open their heart that way. The next style is the service style. So in Acts chapter 9, we have a woman named Tabitha, a.k.a. Dorcas. And she was a bit of a dork, but she was known for always doing good and helping the poor. Here's what she did. She made robes. She made clothing for people in need. And so you just look at how she spends her time. She's caring for others. And, and you see the love of Jesus. This is a beautiful, like, behind-the-scenes servant of God. And she was so beloved, and her work was so important that when she died, the people, they called Peter, like, Peter, you got to come. You got to do something. And so Peter revives her from the dead so she can continue doing the work that she's been doing, serving others. Tabitha was probably a quiet soul, not one for the spotlight. She probably would have hated being on a stage like this, doing what I'm doing right now. But God used her in a powerful way, and it impacted the people that God placed in her path. And so again, today, like WizKids is a perfect example of service evangelism. Like if you're sitting there and you're going, gosh, that's me, service I, I, I could do that. Like I really want to encourage you, go talk to Marilyn. Go find out more about WizKids, service style of evangelism. So, so the final one is actually not in the book, but I just think it's true, and we would call that the, the responsive style. So this is that person who's just like up for anything God says to do, like whatever, whenever, and they just have this ability to, to hear the Holy Spirit, what, it's, what the Holy Spirit, what he's doing, and just kind of respond to it. And you've got Philip's in Acts chapter 8. It says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he starts out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. And this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So Here's what happens. The, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading the book of Isaiah, and he's up in his chariot when all of a sudden, you know, Philip kind of comes up to him and says, what you reading? And he goes, well, actually, I'm reading the book of Isaiah. It's really good, but it's also quite confusing. I wish I had someone who could explain it to me. And he's like, well, you know what? As it turns out, I've got a few minutes, and I happen to know quite a bit about that. And so he shares with him. And, and here's the, the, the Ethiopian eunuch's response. This is, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? Right. Now, in the Old Testament, it says that anyone with crushed testicles, this is the Bible, not me, anyone who has crushed testicles or is a eunuch is a surgically altered sexual minority. They can't participate in covenant worship. And so he's probably sitting there saying, like, okay, I, I've read about Jesus. Like, I've, you're telling me about Jesus. I've read the Old Testament. I'm very interested in this. But is there a place for me? And, and I believe that, that what he's asking when he says, what's going to stop me from being baptized, is he's saying, I've read the Old Testament. Is there room for someone like me? And what's fascinating here is that in Isaiah 56, there's this beautiful promise that happens when the Messiah comes. 
it, it says this, regarding the eunuchs, it says, To them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. See, there's a promise for those who were formally cast out. That they could belong, that they could be grafted in, that they could find joy in God's presence. And so Philip baptizes him in the desert, and then all of a sudden he's just like teleported somewhere, like beam me up. I don't know what happens. He disappears. It's crazy. The point is, he's just ready for like whatever, whenever. Go to the desert. Okay, sure. And some angel shows up, and he just responds to where he's, where he's led. And I understand, like, if an angel showed up, that feels different. But some of you have this extraordinary ability to just hear the Holy Spirit as he nudges you to do something. You know, it could be, go talk to that homeless person. You know what? Stop your car and help, help this woman change her tire. Or, or this just like, you know what? You, you need to give $100 to this person. And you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know why right now, but you just need to do this. And I'm actually quite envious of people who, who can hear God and respond in that way, the responsive style. And so, so here's what I want from you. Here's, here's what I want from you today. I want you to be the type of person that embraces the scandal of evangelism. It's not really in vogue right now. It's kind of taboo, isn't it? It's a little rebellious, culturally speaking. Like, be a cultural rebel. It'll make people squirm. There'll be murmurings about you. Oh, yeah, did you, did you hear about Ralph? Ooh. But Jesus never let those things stop him from sharing good news. He, he says this, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner, one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. If Jesus is willing to leave the 99 for the one, you better believe he'll leave the 10 for the 90. And so I want you not only to have this shepherding care of Jesus being under his leadership, but, but I want you to have his shepherding heart as well. That, that everywhere we go, we're, we're looking for ways to get our friends to meet Jesus. There's this incredible scene in Luke chapter 5. So you have four friends of a paralyzed man, and they're just determined to get him to Jesus because Jesus can heal him. And so um, they get to the house where Jesus is, and the house is full. They can't get in. There's nothing they can do. They, they try to, like, get in through a window, you know. And nope, there's, it's blocked off. Can't do that. Okay, let's go around. Maybe there's a back door. No, nope, can't go that way. And then all of a sudden, one of these friends just says, follow me. And they all go up to the roof, and they start lowering this friend through the roof, to Jesus. Like you can almost picture the Pharisees. They're like, what is happening here? Like, that's not in the manual. You can't do that. And then, then Jesus says something that's heresy, except it's Jesus saying it. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. I, I don't understand how all of this works, like truthfully. It's not a formula. There's really no guarantees. But here's what I do know. Desperation unleashes crazy things. They were willing to do whatever it takes. Like, I've just got to get my friend to Jesus. And so I want you to be that sort of person. Like, don't you want to be that sort of person who just won't take no for an answer? I mean, you're literally, like, you're pulling off the roof to get your friend to Jesus. I want to be that sort of person. And I know in your heart that you do, too. I know you want to say, like, hey, I don't know. All I know is I was blind, and now I can see. I, I, I know in your heart you want to say, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. 
I know in your heart you want to warn people. Avoid the wrath of God and find life. I know that that you want to make space so that people can just pour out their hearts and receive the good news of Jesus. I I know you want to be that kind of person. Just when the Spirit moves, you, you just, you respond. You do it. I know it's in your heart. And so I want to call you to it. Let's be the people who leave the 10% for the 90. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we, um, well, we just confess. We're not very good at this. Most, most of us, most of the time, we struggle with this evangelism. It, it is scary. Culturally speaking, it, it, there's a lot of pressure that makes it feel like, is this even a good thing to do? Or is this just totally wrong? And so, God, I just, I just pray that you would give us your heart, that you would replace our, our fears and our doubts, our concerns, our inability. Replace that with your shepherding heart. Replace that with the love that you have the love that you have for people. Give us boldness. Give us courage. Give us the ability to see what it is, how you've created us. What is that that evangelism style? Uniquely qualified. We're uniquely gifted for. God, we love you. And we are just so grateful that you loved us enough to come. And let everyone know that you are the Messiah and the kingdom of God is at hand. We just pray this all in Christ's powerful name. Amen.